You don't need to be racist to um, have bias. I think people, when they think about racism, they're thinking about you know, old-fashioned racism, they're thinking about burning crosses, they're thinking about people with hoods on. We can call that bias, right? And it is bias and it is racism and so forth. Those people are more extreme, you know, they're not, they don't exist everywhere, they're not your everyday person. We all can also possess bias and it's bias that, you know, um, is harder to detect and it's bias sometimes that's more subtle and uh, we also can act on that bias. So stereotyping is really about the beliefs that we have about a particular social group. The feelings that we have about a social group, um, that's called prejudice. So we have a belief and we have an attitude, basically. And then when you combine those, that's bias. And when bias affects our behavior, we call that discrimination, right? So we have stereotyping. We have prejudice that we can kind of wrap around um, and sort of think about as bias, and that bias can influence our behavior, which we call discrimination. One of the things that I study the most is um, this uh, association between uh, race and crime and blackness and criminality in particular. African Americans um, you know, make up um, about you know, a little less than 13% of the U.S. population, but make up almost 40% of the uh, prison population. And so I look at that kind of disparity, which is fairly extreme, and I try to do studies to see how that disparity might sort of influence our support for punitive criminal justice policy. In some ways, you could think about that as um, you know, an explicit stereotype because people kind of know it. But the way in which it could become implicit is that you can act on that association without your conscious awareness. In Oakland, they uh, used to have a foot pursuit policy where you know, if someone was running and you're sort of chasing someone, you could chase them in down a blind alley or into a backyard. And now uh, they changed the policy um, so that um, if someone runs into a backyard, you're not supposed to go in after them. You're supposed to step back, you're supposed to set up a perimeter, you're supposed to uh, call for backup or to use more resources. And they found that um, changing that policy had a huge effect. They used to have eight, eight or so uh, officer-involved shootings a year, and now um, over the course of five years uh, they've only had uh, eight officer-involved shootings. But you could see you know, that that could also potentially change bias, right, because you're not acting quickly, sort of having to make a decision where you're under like um, sort of threat. It's a policy that removes officers from these conditions that would generate um, this bias. There are a lot of um, ways in which people are trying to tackle unconscious bias in the workplace. And I think one of the main ways people are doing that is through training. The goal there really is to try to give you more information about how bias works and so forth. But, but knowledge alone is not enough to actually address the issue that you, you need to do more. And my worry is that with a lot of the training, first of all, we don't know how effective they are because they're rarely uh, rigorously evaluated. And so we don't know that. The other worry I have is that if you only do the training, you actually don't um, you know, really make good headway into fixing problems. If you do the training be and, and you kind of check that box and, and, and that's all you do to address it, there are ways in which you're not examining your practices or your policies or, or, the, or your kind of workplace culture. Um, and all those things can contribute various kinds of disparities which can um, potentially lead to bias. And so you want to tackle all of that and you can't do that in a simple one-shot training. I've done studies um, in the K through 12 uh, environment to uh, address racial disparities in discipline. For example, African American children are disciplined more uh, frequently and I think more severely than you know children of any other um, uh, racial group. And so we were interested in why that happens. We uh, designed a study with practicing teachers. It was an online study. We um, had them um, sort of imagine they were teaching you know at a at a school and they. 
they um, uh, got a referral note um, on, on a student and it described a child who was disrupting the class uh, by getting tissues out of a tissue box. We asked them how they would uh, discipline uh, that child. For some of them, they thought the child was uh, Darnell and for others, they thought the child was Greg. And so that was the way we manipulated the race of the student. And we found uh, initially, at least, um, the, the race didn't seem to matter. But when we told them this same child three days later uh, misbehaved again, and we described a different misbehavior. So this time the child was sleeping in class. There we saw a huge uh, racial um, uh, difference emerge where they thought that the misbehavior of Black Darnell was much more severe than the misbehavior of, of uh, White Greg. And they wanted to punish that behavior more with um, you know, Black Darnell. And so we saw some evidence there of racial bias. It seemed to be when the child was black, uh, the teacher saw a pattern there. They connected one infraction to the other and they saw a pattern and that led them to think that this um, black child was a troublemaker and was gonna be a big hindrance to teaching and so forth. Um, but with the white child, they saw the misbehaviors as isolated. Like one incident had nothing to do with the other and so you didn't get this sort of escalation in terms of uh, how the child should be disciplined. The bias kind of comes from partly from how we're wired. Our brain kind of takes shortcuts, right? Because we're exposed to all this stimuli and um, we you know, are sort of in a world where there's a wealth of information and things happening. And so you need a way to sort through that. You need a way to categorize what you're seeing so you can manage it better. But there's also bias that is due to um, what we're exposed to out in the world, uh, right? So the disparities that we're disposed to out in the world can actually influence our bias. And so when you combine those, you, you got the brain functioning and you have these sort of societal influences it could seem overwhelming right and that maybe you know there's no way there's no cure uh, for this bias is something that we have to um, uh, manage so it's not something that we can think if we do X Y and Z we'll get rid of bias and we never have to sort of think about that again I think it, it's something that we have to manage just like it, we manage our, our weight or we you know uh, manage our um, you know our hygiene so there are definitely things that you can do to mitigate it um, there are things that you can do to uh, make it less likely that uh, that bias is going to influence your decision making or your actions and we know a lot about those situations and so I think in that way um, we can be hopeful